The Unshackled Waves, episode 182. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Australian politics looks like finally settling down after last week's Liberal leadership crisis. Scott Morrison has now been sworn in as our 30th Prime Minister, and so has his new ministry. The question is now, can he heal the Conservative and moderate factions in the Liberal Party and be the type of leader that the base of the party wants? But first, you'll remember that The Unshackled provided extensive coverage of Lauren Southern and Stefan Molyneux's Australian tour during July, including both in and outside the Melbourne event. Because of the aggression of the leftist protesters, the tour promoters axiomatic were given a $68,000 bill from Victoria Police for their service that night. Given that such a charge encourages the left's antics further, uh, axiomatic are refusing to pay and have launched the Free Speech Coalition to end this warp practice. Axiomatic is fronted by our good friend Dave Pello, who joins us to explain his plan to fight this bill. Dave, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much, Tim. Always a pleasure being on Australia's most popular alt media channel, The Unshackled. Oh, well, I like to, to think so. Now, yeah. uh, I'd first like to start, what's uh, life been like after the tour? Because obviously it was uh, insanely uh, busy and, and now it's happened. So uh, what's... Th- What's the aftermath been like? Have you settled back to normal life? Well, it's the first time I've ever done anything this big. I've organised a few events before, but um, the, you know, a national tour is just another level altogether. And the work doesn't stop um, just because you're, you're back in the office. There's so much following up to do. Of course, in the wake of Auckland being cancelled, heaps of logistical work that has to go on there, processing uh, you know, something like $80,000 worth of refunds, um, and just the 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 ongoing um, you know wrap up and wash up of, of it all is um, is actually quite significant. But it was uh, good to get back to the office. Life is starting to get back to normal. I'm starting to pay attention to my own channel again. And um, you know now I've actually got time to turn my attention to this unconscionable bill from the Daniel Andrews government. Yeah, uh, what made this tour pro- uh, probably well, the one of the most difficult uh, to, to manage was because organising an event is one thing, but when you're up against Australia's mainstream media, uh, government agencies and the, the local uh, leftist activists, it makes it that much harder and a whole uh, new range of things to manage. Yeah, look, um, I think the events went fairly well, um, but it was non-stop uh, moving from crisis to crisis. And um, the left were determined to make things as hard as possible. And um, they've got this effect on society um, called the thug's veto, where they're, you know a venue will cancel simply because they're afraid of the far left extremists. Um, that's the thugs veto in effect. And it, it, it's um, something that we have to deal with and contend with. Um, I don't want to accept it as a, a reality of life. I think it's a reality of the current culture that we have, which is something that independent journalists like um, you are able to have a part in changing the culture, talking about this problem and making it um, socially unacceptable for people to behave in this thuggish, brutish, lawless uh, kind of way. And Melbourne was the most difficult uh, Australian uh, show to to o- organise. There were numerous venues that, that mm. cancelled. It's it's where the the campaign against racism and fascism are based. To they, they pro- counter protest uh, everything. But uh, thankfully, you were able to uh, find a, a venue, and uh, we all enjoyed the, the the Melbourne show. It was it was it was great that it was able great. to take place. Uh, but uh, of course, after all of that uh, ringing around trying to get at uh, venues, the of course the final kick was the the sixty eight thousand dollar police bill, and of course you uh, had your own private security uh, yeah. there, there as well. Yep. Look, um, the venue owner there um, at La Mirage was an absolute hero, willing to take bullets for his business. He's lost a couple of functions, people who cancelled because um, they're believing the lies from the left uh, about um, racism and other 
you know, character assassination slurs like that, which have absolutely no basis in fact. Um, so, look, an encouragement now to anybody watching this, jump on Facebook, go to the La Mirage reception um, Facebook page and give them a five star review. They've been hammered by the organized left and um, we need to be able to. It's one of the ways we can actually counter the thugs veto is um, just by going, giving this guy a thumbs up and congratulating him for his bravery, his excellence in service and, and being a great venue that refused to be intimidated by those people who were trying to um, in, intimidate them. The police actually, you know, mentioned a, a bill for their services um, very early on in the piece. Um, now, something I, I've actually seen Lisa Neville um, put on letterhead from her um, is that the event organisers, Axiomatic, uh, Luke and myself, were not cooperative with police. Um, which is being extremely loose with the facts, and that's the most charitable way I can put it. We were extremely cooperative with the police. We were talking with them months ahead of the event. We had lots of conversations with their counterterrorism um, unit, with their state event planning unit, with everybody that they wanted to. We went above and beyond f falling over ourselves to be as helpful as possible, to make their job as possible. And that's what they told us and confirmed back to us. So it smacks of political opportunism and spin for the police minister to come out now and say we were less than cooperative. It's a it's a lie. It's a bald-faced lie and I defy her to quote a member of her, her her service who dealt with us who has that opinion. Defy her to. Call her out. Lisa, you're spinning the truth maliciously. Uh, it's not serving you very well. Quote the person who dealt with us who believes we were not fully cooperative with them because um, the facts don't care about your feelings, darling. Um, that's not the truth. And then they quoted us $150,000. Um, we, we believed that that was intended to make us change our mind about bringing the event to, um, to Victoria. Um, but we're not easily intimidated. You don't take on this kind of promotion if um, you're in it for the money, you do it because you believe in the future of Australia. Um, and, you know, that's exactly what we wanted to continue with. And the same reason we, we do independent media is because you're not in it for the money. Anybody that thinks you're in it for the money is in the wrong country. That's America. In Australia, um, it's very, very hard going to make ends meet doing this kind of activism. Um, but they ended up saying, look, the real cost was about $230,000, but you guys have been so cooperative. So we're just going to do you guys a favor and only make it $67,842.50. Thanks, guys. Big oh, help. Yeah. Yeah, that's everybody very, everybody very we spoke to, them. yeah, very generous. Everybody in the police force we spoke to was embarrassed by being the messenger for, for that bill. It didn't come from anybody operational or on the ground. It came from the bureaucratic ranks and uh, perhaps even higher than them. And, um, you know, that's it's it's a tragedy. Um, I'm just writing some articles at the moment about it, some editorials. And, uh, you know, there's two choices the Daniel Andrews government has in Victoria about the kind of future they want for political debate. Do they want the kind of political debates where a private citizen will hire a venue will sell tickets and people will come to hear a speech and ask some questions, fully cooperating with the police, never breaking a single law. That's option one. Or would they like the kind of political debate where people um, go to the street without a permit to protest, they behave lawlessly, they assault police, they block highways, they um, damage and vandalise private property, willfully damage private property, they flash their junk to women and children and assault and intimidate, um, you, you know, the, the people that are just trying to attend a, a peaceful event. The, the government has two choices on what kind of event they would like to promote, and they do it effectively with a $68,000 bill. They make it much harder they make it financially impossible to hold a peaceful assembly free speech event um, of the kind that we tried to in Victoria. Um, and they actually give extra incentives and reasons. The thugs are going, yee Now when we protest, not only do they get violence, but they also get financial injuries as well. 
courtesy of our actions. Now, how is this bill legally issued? It seems to be a uniquely uh, Victorian uh, charge because right. uh, it didn't occur in any other state. And of course, last mm. year when Milo Yiannopoulos uh, first came, uh, Penthouse, they were issued with a $50,000 uh, bill for, for the promoters. So what is, uh, how, how, how do they go about uh, legally charging, charging promoters for this? Well, they claim there's legislation which provides for, and there is legislation which they're referring to, legislation exists. Their interpretation of it is that it gives them the right to charge for-profit events um, a, a fee for, for using police resources, which is ridiculous. Uh, it, it's, it's completely illogical. They're, what they're doing is they're equating 800 people in a reception function venue to 100,000 people at Etihad Stadium or, you know, the, the MCG. Um, clearly, those two events have only one thing in common and other than that are substantially different. The only thing they have in common is they both sell tickets. 100,000 people presents inherent logistical problems such as traffic flow, um, crowd management, and the statistical probability of 100,000 people having the kind of people in it that need behavioural support from police. But 800 people going to hear a speech in a function venue is not out of the ordinary at all. It never needs police assistance. The thing that needed police assistance was the lawless, violent, extremist leftists who decided to wreck the event. So comparing the two events is absolutely nonsensical. What's actually um, needing the financial penalty and the disincentive are uh, the domestic terrorists that, that decide to use fear and intimidation to achieve um, their political outcomes that they desire in Australia. Now, what avenues are available to challenge this uh, bill? Now, you've uh, launched the, oh, it's not, not just you, it's supported by a number of other uh, people and organisations, the Free Speech uh, Coalition. This will be its uh, first project looking at yeah. avenues to, to challenge it. So can you tell us what the, the strategy uh, is uh, for this? Well, the strategy is that the legal grounds for this law are very, very shaky. Um, yes, they have a police, a bit of legislation in which they claim gives them the authority, but we've seen bad laws overturned by courts before because they violate um, higher, more important laws. And in this case, uh, the legal advice um, we've received is that the purpose of police is more important than the functions of police. And where those two things contradict each other, a judicial review is likely to refer the police and the Daniel Andrews government back to the legislated purpose of police. And that is to uphold the law and provide an, an orderly, safe society for Victorian citizens. Um, now, where a function of police radically undermines the purpose of police, um, and this kind of bill does radically undermine common law rights to enjoy a safe society and peaceful assembly, um, then the court is likely to, to tell them to go back to the drawing board and interpret it or rewrite the legislation differently um, because the, the two things are mutually exclusive. If that should fail, however, then we're happy to take it to the High Court because we believe that there is a great risk uh, and an obvious risk to any reasonably minded person that the implied freedom of political communication is being directly threatened um, and, and violated by the imposition of, of prohibitively um, you know, enormous fees. There's no way this event would have gone ahead if we had to factor in $68,000 worth of police resources. There just wasn't that kind of profit in it. It just wouldn't have gone ahead. And so this legislation is effectively censorious um, to public debate. Um, not only does it incentivize violence, um, unintentionally, perhaps it was an, an ignorant mistake, but it does nevertheless incentivize violence and more of it so that the enemies of Antifa, such as logic, reason and common sense, um, get financial penalties. But not only does it add those penalties to it and, and undermine common law rights, it also violates um, the implied constitu constitutional freedoms of uh, political expression. And we're uh, quite certain the High Court will um, look favourably on such an easy test case. Um, the, the technicality, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I, love, I love law um, and, you know, I've tried to understand it, but essentially the technicality is that um, executive branches of government, such as the police are, um, do not have 
the you know the, the same laws apply to executive branches of government as applies to government and the laws about freedom of speech and political communication aren't about you or me they're not a you know when we censor people on our pages ban them block them you know because we don't like the way they're talking that's not a violation of free speech free speech principles are all about the governments the authoritarian incursion on on our freedoms by by government government is there to, to protect our rights not infringe on our rights so you know a the abc not giving a platform to conservatives uh, probably a bad example because they're government funded um the project on channel 10 not giving a platform to um to me to air my views isn't censorship it, it's not a violation of my right to free speech um you know nor is me not putting on um you know bob brown at a, at a venue they have just as much right to go and hire the venue the next day there's no obligation on me to do it but when the government um and we think the the high court will extend um that interpretation to an executive branch of the government um you know it makes an incursion upon the rights of people to express political opinions um that is a, a contravention of the implied constitutional freedom and there's some pretty hard um, cases which have been decided recently which we think will be very supportive of our position now i don't want to go to court i'm hoping the andrews government can realize that the effect even even just on the morality you know i, I actually maybe give them the credit of trying to do the right thing mm, uh, for victoria <laughs> but, you know let's let's just be generous and suggest that if they were trying to do the right thing for australia and for victorians then surely they could see that this kind of legislation and its interpretation and application is having the effect of incentivizing violence instead of preventing violence which is the the purpose of victoria police so in having the opposite of the intended effect they should stop the application of the law or fix the law or just you know apply it to you know crazy big events that that are common common sense the law in perth is much more sensible it says if the event is over 5000 people there will be a contribution user pays facility that makes sense to me but you know a venue that normally holds events of this size with only 800 people coming no traffic you know implications or or need for the police other than the fact that the attendees and the speakers were targets of political violence from extremists that shouldn't be a an attracting a fee all that is is victim blaming so that's why we're opposed to it and look this isn't an easy fight um the free speech the australian free speech coalition is a a spin off if you like a inspired by the new zealand free speech coalition um which was also started care of the lauren southern and stephen mullen new tour um and what we are is saying let's do this together there's no way i can do this by myself but i want to be able to look my grandchildren in the eye my future grandchildren in the eye um one day and say i did everything i could to create an australia that was free and just and i did it for you and that's the kind of thing that my grandparents would have wanted for my grandchildren and that's why we're doing it and look we really really need donations if you can not only sign the petition but um but share it on on facebook and social media if they let you um but you know dig deep and contribute to the fighting fund this is for the future of all of us and if there's any money left over or if the andrews government decides to back down and um do the right thing then the unused funds and will be saved for the next battle because there will be another one there will always be another one especially for people in independent media we've got nigel farage coming soon we've got gavin mcginnis coming soon we've got um, milo coming again with um what's her name and coulter um, and coulter you know these events are going to keep coming and the bills from the victorian government are going to keep coming there will always be another battle unless we stand our ground now and say thus far and no further we've had enough of it we demand the right to free speech it's just common sense approach to a liberal democracy yeah we can't leave Uh, certainly can't let this be allowed to stand. I mean, as you said, there's uh, other events coming up, and the left uh, in Melbourne are even more uh, empowered and 
than ever, mm. ever. So I would encourage everyone to go on the free speech, uh, coalition dot info is the, is the website, uh, uh sign great. up at the very least and consider making a, a, con a contribution. So thanks Thank Dave, for coming on the, the show today and, uh, make sure you continue to <laughs> take it easy and yeah, we'll yep. definitely uh, ke uh, keep in touch. Thanks for all your hard work, Tim. And now on with the week in Australian politics with The Unshackled's political editor, Michael Smythe. Michael, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Tim. It seems like uh, things are finally well, set settling down in, in Canberra. Uh, we did two live episodes uh, last week. Uh, we uh, have... we went to air when uh, Scott Morrison was just being sworn in as Prime Minister. Uh, now he's unveiled his uh, new look uh, ministry. And of course, all the, the speculation was, would it be an inclusive uh, ministry by uh, having a mix of conservatives and uh, moderates? And uh, so far, I, I would say that uh, Morrison uh, hasn't uh, done much to, to heal the, the wounds. Uh, he's put uh, moderates in key positions in the cabinet. Uh, Maurice Payne, who was defence minister, who seems to be enabling the uh, social justice uh, f form that the defence force has taken. She's now moving to foreign affairs. Everyone was breathing a sigh of relief that Julie Bishop was out of foreign affairs and couldn't dole out uh, Australian money to all of these uh, despotic overseas countries, but we've probably ended up with somebody worse now because Payne's from the far left of the party. Yeah, um, that's a very laconic and very subtle way of putting it. Um, Julie Bishop was at least intelligent. Uh, highly trained lawyer, very erudite, very Quick intelligent wits. and able to talk to pretty much anyone. But... If Payne's tenure at foreign affairs is going to look anything like well, as I said to a meeting that I was attended earlier this evening, God help us all. I do not have any faith in her abilities as foreign minister. That's pretty blunt. And admittedly, I haven't actually had the pleasure of meeting her, so maybe I'm being a little harsh, but at the same time, I, I'm very concerned. It's like Nicola Roxon, but in the Liberal Party. And Payne moving to foreign affairs means that Christopher Pine is the new uh, defence minister and everyone's just been oh, picturing that uh, Christopher Pine being who he is in charge of our armed forces and I'm sure a lot of you have seen the the memes on the internet uh, with uh, Pine saying I feel safe for already and uh, there was one that said uh, when he meets James Mattis oh, uh, what, what do you do I keep people up at night and Pine says I'm a fixer I fix things <laughs> fixes things and gets hacked by trolls on 4chan who make him look at um, some dubious materials, shall we say. Yes, uh, but it's uh, that, that was just a personal Twitter account. It didn't compromise his ability to keep the nation safe. No, but it certainly compromised his sleep and his, um, and his family life, I'm sure. <laughs> I actually felt a little bit sorry for um, Christopher after that happened. I thought to myself, this is um, this is extremely unfortunate. It was even more unfortunate for him when Corey Bernardi chose his words less carefully than usual when he was asked about it. That, that press conference, well, it was actually a press conference, it was just a presser outside Parliament House, was quite amusing. Look, the thing is, look, in fairness to Pine, I think if he listens to Chobo, who's been appointed as the Minister for Defence Industry, then we might just be okay. But I wouldn't want to put any money on it, put it that way. Because remember, junior ministers very rarely, sorry, junior cabinet ministers rarely override or influence their senior cabinet colleagues. 
Well, everyone was hoping that when Turnbull left, it, it would also spell the end of uh, people such as uh, Pine and, and Simon Birmingham, who are the key well, moderates, or well, most people would say left left us uh, in the in the cabinet uh birmingham's been moved from education which everyone thought he was hope hopeless at to uh trade tourism and investment where uh hopefully he can't do too much uh damage but yeah the 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 key moderates the the ones who uh defended uh, turnbull's progressive agenda until the end uh, are still there the 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 triple a team uh is not back uh andrew is uh, abbott and also michael suka who uh is one of the uh senior conservatives uh from victoria as assistant minister uh, morrison's booted him uh from the the ministry well like i said last week it almost seems like they went through all that turmoil and fracas for nothing because of the fact that they just they they switched out one moderate for a conservative who has been known more recently for being a moderate. And this, this attempt at balance that uh, Morrison has done, has made rather, is it, it's, it would be admirable if it weren't for the fact that he has gutted Peter Dutton's portfolio. He hasn't uh, rewarded hard work. Yes, immigration's gone to David Coleman, who nobody had ever heard of. Mm -hmm. Word is amongst uh, my contacts is that he is a moderate as well. But he is in one of the Western Sydney seats, which happens to include the enclave of Lakemba. So as I thought to myself cynically this morning, when here the oh, this evening rather, when being reminded of that fact, I thought to myself, "Oh crap! I better start learning Arabic then." Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, yeah. There's some like obviously you expect the the Liberal Party to be uh, tougher on like immigration and uh, assimilation, but once they get a seat which has uh, Muslims in it, same with Craig Laundie, then they just fall to water. Mm -hmm. Well, Craig Laundie was involved with Get Up. There are photos of him with Get Up volunteers in his office. And it should be noted as well that the Turnbull loyalists, or the former Turnbull loyalists, they're not loyal to him anymore, obviously, only to their own re-election prospects, they have been saying, oh, Tony Abbott should go. Andrew Lamming said the other day that Tony Abbott should resign. And I'm thinking to myself, Andrew, shut up. You should resign. You haven't <laughs> done anything but sit in that seat for ages, stopping other people who have more talent than you from, you know, actually representing the, the electorate. Come on. I, I know I know I know plenty of people who are younger than me and more qualified than him to in terms in terms of community organization and community representation, even on the Labour side <laughs> than Lamming. And Craig Laundy, he was one of the uh, the two uh, MPs who walked in the party room with Turnbull, the other being Arthur Zinedinus, who, who flew down from uh, Sydney. And Laundy has, has gone to the back bench. He was the, the, the Minister for uh, Workplace uh, Relations. He said that oh, it was so uh, traumatic, the, the, the events of the past week. I'm, I'm sitting on the back bench to consider my future. Oh, didums. Well, maybe get out of the Liberal Party then and run as a member of the Labor Party of the Greens. Hypocrite. Now, there were some decent appointments to the cabinet. Angus Taylor uh, is the new energy minister, and he's considered a climate change skeptic. And <laughs> Morrison was quite cringeworthy when he was introducing Angus Taylor, saying that, that he want, uh, wanted to push energy prices down, 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 so the Morrison government would go up, up, up. And... We have uh, Dan Tian, who uh, there's this dispute with the, the Catholic education sector. Dan Tian's a Catholic, so you'd hope a uh, Catholic education minister can get along with Catholic schools and put this, well, what seems like an unnecessary uh, distraction uh, to bed. Oh, you mean after Birmingham buggered it up? Yeah, yeah, yeah so it's calling them Judases. 
I'm sorry, say that again. I didn't catch that last bit. Simon Birmingham, he accused the, the, the Catholic schools of um, being taken in by the Judas Labour Party. Well, maybe if the Liberal Party had remembered its lesson from the 1950s and 60s and hadn't resumed alienating Catholic schools, maybe this, would, this wouldn't have happened in the first place. That being said, the religious independent school system does need some work. Anyway, that's another topic for another time. However, uh, that being said, Etienne was previously in social services, if I recall correctly, and, well, let's just say more and more reports about Centrelink's incompetence are coming out than had been in the years prior. So who knows? It could be... He, maybe he maybe it was just because he had a crappy department. Maybe it's because he had been thrown in the deep end. Maybe there's stuff beyond his control. Who knows? In regards to in regards to Tian, I th I don't think he can do any worse than Birmingham did. To be honest, <laughs> it's a so, low bar. Wait and see. Well, yeah, it is a low bar, isn't it? I mean, I have a low bar for all these people because I'm just so bitterly disappointed with the Liberal Party, and I pointed that out tonight when I was um. One, when I was plugging the show, and two, speaking to other people about uh, the reasons why I left the Liberal Party. And some of the people in this list are the reason why I left the Liberal Party. Now, there was uh, much uh, speculation whether Morrison would elevate Tony Abbott to uh, the, the front bench or, or cabinet. A lot of conservative commentators were saying uh, it should be uh, done, but uh, Morrison and Abbott, they've, well, they, they've had uh, a falling out or pretty much since uh, Morrison uh, didn't do anything to save his prime ministership in, in 2015. Uh, now, Morrison, uh, given that there is a former prime minister and a former deputy prime minister now on the back bench, he's uh, made uh, Tony Abbott a special envoy for Indigenous Affairs and Barnaby Joyce a special envoy for drought assistance, which are completely new positions. We've never had special envoys in a government uh, before and mm. they, they seem to be more ceremonial and honorary positions it's it's like the uh, when collingwood created the director of coaching job for for mick malthouse when they didn't want him as coach anymore <laughs> uh, that, that's what it sounds like and abbott uh has uh, said that, well, I want to know what the, the role uh, specifically entails. I, I don't want to be stepping on like a minister's toes and, you know, who, who am I going to be reporting to? Meanwhile, I think Barnaby Joyce just wants something to do. And so he's taken, taken the position, no questions asked. The thing is with Tony Abbott being offered this, it's a signal honour. And same with Barnaby, it's a signal honour. It's not, doesn't mean anything. It's purely ceremonial. It's a it's lip service to their parliamentary tenure and their ministerial tenure under the crown. That's all it is. It's not recognizing their skills. It's not utilizing their skills. As I pointed out um, at a meeting I went to tonight, I was telling you about it. When there has been a leadership spill in the Western world, not just in Australia, but what we call leadership spill anywhere in the Western world, except well, the Anglosphere anyway, uh, what will happen is the two candidates will duke it out and one will win, the other one will lose. But the loser will, in a lot of cases, be given the foreign affairs or external affairs portfolio. Now, this happened with Bob Hawke and Bill Hayden in the 1980s, 1983. Hawke won the election and aligned side against that bastard Fraser um, and made um, Bill Hayden as foreign minister. Um, again, in 1996, when John Howard won a landslide against Paul Keating, he made Alexander Downer, the previous leader of his party, the foreign minister. Incidentally, he also made John Moore his defense minister and John Howard and John Moore were sworn blood enemies for quite a while, but I'll get onto that point later. Um, and of course, we all know in 2008 in America, um, Obama won the primary against Hillary Clinton. And when he won the presidency from the Republican, from the Republicans, 
he made Hillary Clinton his Secretary of State. A bad idea in retrospect, but it was it's what you do. You you give your former leaders or your failed leaders or your failed leadership aspirants a consolation prize. And they didn't do that. And this is the difference between Scott Morrison and Malcolm Turnbull and also John Howard made peace with his enemies, as it were, made jo put John Moore in defense and put Alexander Downer in foreign affairs. He also incidentally made Andrew Peacock ambassador to, uh, ambassador to the United States of America. There is no real bridge building here. There's no healing here. It's all just window dressing. Yeah. And that's what frustrates me the most about it. It's all just window dressing. And yeah, you've got a few... You put a few more conservatives in the Adam ministry, but you've demoted some of the good conservatives and you've elevated more of the moderates to even more imperative positions in the in the in the cabinet. Yeah, I, I think the reason why Morrison, yeah, of course he didn't want to give Abbott a a senior uh, position, so he's created this special envoy. So if Abbott doesn't take it, then uh, he still looks like he's bitter and twisted. Um, Though uh, Abbott, uh, with his uh, chat with Ray Hadley on Monday morning, uh, indicated that he, he was just glad that Turnbull had been taken out because he said the, the era of the political assassin is over. Malcolm <laughs> Turnbull uh, went out uh, the, the same way that he came in. You live by the sword, you die by the sword, which, which sounded a bit like Abbott had got enough satisfaction to sort of not snipe anymore. <laughs> oh yes oh yes granted he wouldn't have called um morrison the same way gorton did hawk in 1983 but i'm sure there was a lot of schadenfreude that tony abbott enjoyed in regards to his nemesis being removed or removing himself as it turned out but the thing was and we discussed this last week so i won't belabor the point turnbull's people still kept power they're still in power they still kept power the winner's circle the black hand as it's referred to by detractors within the liberal party is still there and they still hold all of the all of the cards if i were tony abbott i i would probably accept it I'd probably accept the position that he's offered, even though it's a signal honor, because as you pointed out correctly, if he refuses, he's going to be bitter and twisted. The only way he could spin it into his advantage would be to say, I've been offered a signal honor and it's insulting to me. It's insulting to the people of Australia and I'm refusing to do it. But the thing is with Tony Abbott, he's not a wrecker. He's not Malcolm Turnbull. If he had had Malcolm Turnbull's killer instinct, he wouldn't he would have wouldn't have been knifed by him. There's no way he could spin it though, a refusal though, at least not easily. So he's better off accepting the offer. Now Tony Abbott has said he still wants to stay uh, in the parliament. He still uh, believes that he is young, or at 61, he's certainly well, he's fit. So he's certainly got, uh, I think, the the workings of a younger uh, body. But uh, Julie Bishop, uh, she opted. Uh, she didn't contest the deputy leadership. Uh, she has opted to not stay on as a uh, foreign minister. She'll go to the, the back bench, uh, but she's decided she won't retire as the member for Curtin at the, the next election. And everyone's wondering, uh, does she want to uh, hang around to see if she can have another tilt at the, uh, the prime ministership? And it was interesting, the commentary on Sky saying that Oh, Julie Bishop, oh, she should probably stay around to, you know, in, just in case Morrison falls over. Yet, it, it's interesting that it's seen that, you know, Bishop's doing the right thing by just seeing if, like, she can get the prime ministership again. While Abbott's staying, it's just seen that, you know, he's there to be a wrecker. Yet, different treatment for both of them, even though they're mm. essentially both in parliament for the same thing. Oh, exactly. It's a massive double standard, Tim. But of course, the media, sorry, let me rephrase that, our more conventional colleagues in the mainstream fourth estate are either willfully or blindly unaware of their 
double standards and cognitive dissonance when it comes to uh, Julie Abbott and yeah. I'm sorry, Julie Bishop and Tony Abbott. Sorry, I had a bit of a brain freeze then. Um, they're they're unaware of the double standards, or they don't want to know, and they don't care because the media has enjoyed undermining several prime ministers ever since Howard lost in 2007. The Julie Bishop was one of the least offensive members of the parliament. She's she's a lady. She's erudite. She is very competent. I don't always agree with her decisions, obviously, but she is a very competent woman. I'm not going to say anything really negative about her as a person, only about her policies. Um, she did. She did. She did. A, few good things admittedly most of them were under abbott rather than turnbull actually they're all under abbott rather than turnbull come to think of it like the new colombo plan for example that's the big one that was actually a very good um a very good thing to do um in regards to tony abbott tony abbott has served as health minister he served as that's what he he had a few other roles before he became health minister. And uh, workplace when, relations minister. Workplace relations minister. Yes, that's right. Um, that was before Joe Hockey, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Oh, way yeah, before Joe Hockey. It wasn't his decision to bring in work choices. It was um, Joe Hockey under John oh, Kevin, and Kevin Andrews was the initial minister. <clears throat> Indeed. Anyway, point is, Abbott has a lot of experience in the parliament as well and he has still has a lot to offer no, maybe not as prime minister but he still has a lot to offer and i think any uh liberal national coalition government ignores that to their detriment you know i, I think scomo i'm sorry prime minister morrison would have wanted julie to uh, julie bishop to stay but yeah she doesn't she hasn't really majorly upset anyone in the fourth state not the way Tony Abbott has by allowing himself to be taken out of context on so many occasions. It's painful. Now, Malcolm Turnbull is uh, definitely uh, going well. In fact, he's, he's, already, he's planning to resign this week, which is going to trigger a by-election in his inner Sydney seat of Wentworth, which means that uh, the government is reduced to 75 seats because they only have a one seat uh, majority and now even though uh, Turnbull holds Wentworth with 17 percent because it is an inner city seat it was only that the margin was only so big because Malcolm Turnbull was the local member and was uh, uh, progressive on issues uh, such as climate change and same-sex marriage and so basically the the liberals to retain it they need to pick another progressive uh, moderate so there there's four candidates who've been uh, talked about uh, Christine Forster who is uh, Tony Abbott's uh, sister <laughs> uh, wouldn't that be funny if that happened <laughs> Well, even though they are siblings, they're, they're, they were obviously on opposing sides during the, the, the marriage debate. So uh, she's a city of Sydney councillor, so she'd be considered somebody Margaret. who, yeah, who the, <laughs> uh, or the doctor's wives in, in Wentworth would war warm to. Uh, Andrew Bragg, who uh, was, uh, he was head of the, the Libs and Nats for uh, Yes uh, campaign, <laughs> a bit of a theme here with, with, with the candidates. Uh, so he's also been talked about, he's currently working with the Business Council of Australia. Then there's uh, Dave Sharma, who was Australia's ambassador to uh, Israel. And then there is also James Brown, who is uh, Malcolm Turnbull's uh, son-in-law. Uh, so uh, certainly, uh, it's it's going to be a a pretty I, I I'd say I wouldn't say messy I'd say uh, uh, contested uh, quite ex oh, uh, competitive pre-selection. Tim, it's the New South Wales Liberal Party. It's always messy. <laughs> Actually, I have a thought. I have a suggestion. Put Peter King back in. Because he was the guy who got knifed by Turnbull in 2004. Turnbull would then go on to knife not just one, but two party leaders, Brendan Nelson in 2008. And of course, we all know Tony Abbott, 2015. 
Put Peter the King back in, that would be very much poetic justice, I think, as well. Although mm. having Tony Abbott's sister in the seat of Wentworth as well would also be quite amusing. So, I don't know. But like I said, it's the New South Wales Liberal Party. It's always messy. Well, let's turn our attention to the, the polls that, that were uh, released uh, after the uh, week of the, the leadership crisis. And news poll came out uh, Sunday night. Uh, it had the coalition at 44% and Labor at 56%. Uh, landslide territory. Uh, coalition primary vote was at 33%. And even more concerningly, was Shorten was preferred prime minister 39% to Scott Morrison, 33%. And then there was the Guardian Essential poll today that had uh, uh, the coalition at 45% to Labor, uh, 55% with the uh, primary vote at 35%. However, Morrison was preferred Prime Minister, 39% to 29%, which basically shows that the, the, the public, their uh, they, they don't like what's happened in, in Canberra, and they don't really know who Scott Morrison is. When was that last news poll conducted, though? This is something that I'm curious about. I think it happens on about the Thursday or Friday, and it's published on the Sunday night. You know, it was funny. I read something uh, in The Australian today. I was a headline saying that, Oh, Tony got dumped as he was just about to turn it around. Oh, funny that. I'm pretty sure they said the same thing about Tony Abbott as well. Hmm. Let me think. Hmm. But then Tony lost 38 news polls consecutively, setting a new benchmark for getting the hell out of leadership compared to Tony Abbott's 30. Um... Yeah, I was questioning the Fairfax Ipsos poll, which was 46 to 54 um, last week, I believe yeah. it was. What we can see here, and I wouldn't say I was wrong. I'm still a little bit wary about the results being that extreme, but I have said for a while that the Labor Party will win the next general election unless something amazing happens. And since Dunn didn't become Prime Minister, I'm still waiting for that to happen. Anyhow, um, the point that I'm going to make here is quite simple. The fact that we have, across all the polls that you've just cited, including news poll, it has a massive defeat waiting for the Liberal National Coalition. And as a result of that, Labor will win the next election. This, these are consistently bad numbers for the coalition. It doesn't matter what they do now. They changed the leader. They thought it might make a difference. They were wrong. It's just window dressing anyway. Even if their policies do change, which I said last week that they wouldn't because Frydenberg would stifle any conservative moves. Yeah, Scott, so I mean, uh, it's been reported that Scott Morrison has... Uh, no plans to withdraw from the the Paris Climate Accord, and and Julie mm -hmm. Bishop in uh, uh, one of her final statements as uh, foreign minister said that we must uh, uphold our, our international obligations, and or given that that Morrison uh, looks like he's favouring the the moderates more than the conservatives in his uh, reshuffle, uh, I would say Obviously. that that report is quite uh, accurate. He, he went to the, the bush uh, at the beginning of the week because he wanted to make a drought uh, relief a key focus. And everyone was saying that, oh, it was good that he wore a baseball cap. He didn't uh, go for the uh, Akubra, which would have been too cringeworthy. And I was just sort of like, oh, wow, is that what we're focused on? What <laughs> hat he's wearing out, out, out in the bush? I mean, seriously. Yeah, basically, that's what it's like. So, from what you just said, Julie Bishop did her whole um, speech about, oh, we should we should honour our international agreements. What about our sovereignty? What about our bloody sovereignty for crying out loud? And pardon my language, but I'm actually a bit annoyed and disappointed in her in saying this. You know, the last thing she does is say, in her position as foreign minister, says... We should uphold our international obligations. What about our national obligations, Julie? What about we, the people, the forgotten people, 
you're part of the party of Menzies, the party of Menzies that believes in looking after the forgotten people. You and the rest of the Liberal Party seem to have forgotten that. No wonder people are deserting you in droves. They're not all going to Labour either. They're going elsewhere. You need to address that. I'm, I'm bitterly disappointed and dismayed, you know? Because, you know, like I said, I like Julie. You know? I'm just bitterly disappointed. You know what I mean? Hmm. Well, I think the, the, the first week of the Morrison prime ministership has been underwhelming, to, to say the least. I mean, he's got got to do a lot to, to win over the well, the base, let alone the uh, Australian people. I mean, how do you like, how do you come back from a 44 to 56 uh, poll? But hey, Scott Morrison was the one who stopped the boats when everybody said it was impossible. So if anyone can perform a miracle, it's, it's him. Well, speaking of that, apparently there was the first boat in, what was it, 1,400 days that ran aground today somewhere in yeah, North Queensland? Yeah, yeah. And just when there was political instability, they, they just chose that moment to, to send a boat. <laughs> um, well, if they did, they ran aground in the wrong place because I don't think we'll find them, to be honest. Well, we'll obviously keep an eye on how uh, Morrison's prime ministership is uh, progressing and if there there is any substantial policy changes remains to be seen. But uh, uh, we'll uh, jump on again whenever there's uh, major news, Michael, and, and dissect it with our viewers and listeners. And how fat our northern Queensland crocodiles are after illegal immigrants um, run aground. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's the show for today. As always, I'd like to remind you about some exciting upcoming events occurring around the nation. Former UKIP leader and Brexit champion Nigel Farage is almost due in Australia, and he's visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, and Brisbane, as well as Auckland. Tickets are still on sale and can be booked by going to nigellive.com.au. Also coming by year's end is the tour in Australia by internet television personality and founder of the Proud Boys, Gavin McGuinness. He is being hosted by Penthouse Australia. You can book your place by going to gavinlive.com.au. Also, uh, another reminder that we can't bring you uh, all of this uh, news and other productions without your support, so please consider becoming a patron of The Unshackled by going to patreon.com slash The Unshackled. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.